Identity politics. In recent years, this cultural phenomenon has reached a fever pitch. From the Me Too movement to Black Lives Matter, the transgender agenda, immigration, hyper feminist railings against the so called patriarchal hierarchy, the self contradictions of extreme political correctness, the now fractured Women's March movement the increase of censorship and compelled speech, and now even corporate commercials for razors are trying to educate us on the horrors of toxic masculinity. The world is rapidly becoming an even crazier place than it's ever been. Social media, once hailed as the great equalizer of information, functions as an increasingly bizarre and vitriolic landscape of mob mentality shaming tactics, fanatical political polarization, and just and just overall mass confusion. And sure, identity politics are nothing new. In fact, it's probably rather true that all politics are identity politics, and always have been. It's always been about the struggles between various groups of people who identify themselves as groups based on geography, ethnicity, ideology, etc. But I would say that the recent escalations of these tensions and tirades are not merely some natural outworking of conventional identity-based politics, amplified by the fact that the internet now provides a platform and a pulpit to billions of voices that never had one before. I don't think it's a stretch to say that we are living in the era of weaponized identity politics. If the modus operandi of social engineering has always employed Hegelian dynamics, then what we are seeing today in the increasingly fractured and frenzied culture is it's more like the Hegelian dialectic on steroids or maybe on acid or crack or I don't know, take your pick it's no longer a simple formula of thesis plus antithesis equals synthesis and okay, it's not like it ever really was but at least in comparison to today, the binary politics of yesteryear and the old simplistic right-left paradigm, which of course has always been an illusion, it seems almost quaint. 
The globalist agenda has managed to forge ahead for generations through the governmental and corporate mechanisms of allegedly free and democratic nations, all because of that illusion of choice. The red state, blue state, donkeys versus elephants routine has served its purpose quite well. In fact, it's been serving its purpose throughout the spectrum of human history. You could even say that civilization itself was only able to arise via the application and exploitation of identity politics. After all, wars could not be waged, imperialism could never have come to be without the organization of human beings on first a tribal level, and then concentrating into city-states, and then finally allying a number of city-states together into a wider kingdom until you finally have an empire. So it's certainly nothing new and nothing surprising, as we are admittedly tribal creatures. Yet the question remains, why in 2019 are we now facing a society that is plunging into an unprecedented morass of insane political correctness, and the subsequent reactionism to that PC banner, and the entire increasingly convoluted spectrum of agendas and movements and hashtags and so on? I would suggest that the answer is almost too ridiculously obvious. The reason that identity politics is such an effective means of applying the Hegelian dialectic for political purposes is because the whole issue of identity itself is about as foundational to human experience as it gets. We all want to know who we are. It's a deep yearning that has been woven into the very fabric of our being, a yearning placed there by our Creator. A yearning that, when divorced from the source of our identity, separated from a relationship with God, is just begging to be manipulated and weaponized against us. And so while right now we can see that society at large seems to be lost in this downward spiral of political correctness and polarization and celebrity witch hunts and all the rest, we can step back and have no doubts about where it is all going in the end. The debates over whether, quote, toxic masculinity is really the scourge of modern society and arguments over which ethnic groups are the most marginalized and the invention of more and more gender classifications or non-classifications and the insistence that they must all be recognized and affirmed and empowered and all the rest, all of this will continue on, I believe, until the very end. But at the same time, in the midst of all the fury and confusion, there is also a unifying factor amidst all those agendas and positions, all except for one. Despite all the contention and chaos, the one unifying factor behind it all is the attempt to try and identify, define, and defend various conceptions of human identity from within humanity itself. In a word, it's all humanism. That is why the Bible stands in stark and unique contrast to everything that is falling into the factions and fallacies of our modern culture. In Galatians 3, 23 through 29, it says, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until that coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God true faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. And so according to scripture, one may become adopted as sons of God through faith in Christ, there's no longer the ability to identify ourselves in accordance with the way that the world does, according to the myriad of political camps and competing agendas. When your identity is in Christ, something like the battle of the sexist should become wholly obsolete, because while men and women are created unique and distinct from each other by God, with our own roles and tendencies and strengths and weaknesses, etc., at the end of the day, sin is sin. <laughs> The only answer to that issue is the shed blood of Christ for every man and every woman. Jesus' command to love our neighbor as ourself applies in all directions. To love even our enemies. To follow his example and become a servant. It's the absolute antithesis of demanding that the rest of the world acknowledges our rights or our dignity because 
Those things are to be founded in God himself, not from affirmation from the fallen world. Having an identity through faith in Christ stands apart from every other humanistic attempt to find identity, and as a result, we should also understand that we do not subscribe to the same understanding of politics, either. And this is where it comes full circle, I believe, back to the matter of the current social climate. Because it's really so easy to get overwhelmed by it all, to get dismayed or to get triggered into a reaction by one thing or another. And sometimes I can't help but wonder if that isn't really the whole point, or at least to a degree, just, <laughs> just to get a reaction, like one way or another. For instance, let's uh, take for example the, this Gillette ad that I'm sure many, if not most of you, are probably already aware of. It's blatant hyper-feminist propaganda, you know, basically shaming men into confronting the issue of, quote, toxic masculinity and all that. And yep, it's, it's pretty in your face and over the top, and there's already been plenty of response videos and backlash about it. But what gets even more interesting, or even alarming, is that I've seen certain people reviewing this ad, if you can even call it that, <laughs> where they start to focus on how it also seems that it is specifically white men being vilified, whereas non-white men are portrayed as the virtuous guys standing up for the women. And these reviewers want to complain about that and even start quoting statistics about domestic abuse in white households versus black households. And it's like, whoa, like, do you not see what is happening? Do you not see that what you are now doing yourself, you're falling into the same trap, getting sucked into worldly identity politics? And this is something that really hits home uh, especially for those of us Christians who are part of this truther community, because there is such a pervasive mindset towards, you know, exposing this, that, or the other. And sure, there's plenty of instances where exposing evil or exposing agendas is quite appropriate. But at the same time, the more you start to understand how identity politics operates, the more you see how it's not just as simplistic as you know, exposing the evil agenda and calling it a day. We can expose agendas all day long, but have little regard for the lost people who are entrenched in them. For example, take the whole transgender agenda. It's, I mean, it's easy to wring our hands and decry the state of affairs today, where in our hyper-sexualized culture, more and more people are turning to ideas of gender fluidity, to the point now where even children as young as toddlers are being encouraged to transition from boy to girl, or girl to boy, or somewhere in between. But really, all of that is, is really merely symptomatic in the end. It's, it's a tragic symptom of people hungry for a sense of identity, and trying to fill that void by exploring their conflicted feelings about their gender or sexual desires or whatever else. And at the end of the day, to react or speak out against any of these things without anchoring it all with a loving and patient presentation of the true source of identity is to only fall prey to the pitfalls of humanistic thinking, to get pulled back into identity politics, to approach it all from a worldly, carnal perspective instead of a Christ-centered, spiritual one. And even when we succeed in doing that, when we do follow the conviction of making the gospel central to our approach to whatever social topic, we can be sure that it will inevitably only provoke a most hostile reaction from the majority of the humanistic world as a whole. There is a level of divisiveness and polarization that is inevitable because the kingdom of heaven is at complete odds with the kingdoms of this fallen world. I'll close by reading Colossians 3, 1-11. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked, when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. 
Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all.